Thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate the use of your talent for the cause of God. It was on a Sabbath day when Jesus stood up to read in the synagogue. Luke 4 records that he read from the scrolls of Isaiah the prophet. And Jesus simply said, uh, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. The preamble to our Constitution begins, we, the people. Today, I would like to speak on we, the church. Father, take this message now and deliver it in every phase as you would. In Jesus' name, let the church say, Amen. For the most part, we Christians, when we think of captives being set free, we somehow limit this setting free from the bondage of sin. While it has some ultimate validity to being free from Satan's grasp, Jesus in Luke 4 was literally talking about helping the oppressed and the marginalized. The message translation paints a better picture of what Jesus said on that Sabbath in Nazareth. Here's what it says. God's spirit is on me. He has chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor. Sent me to announce pardon of prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burdened and battered free, to announce this is God's time to shine. Today, I was prepared to speak on the final part of my three-part series, Standing on the Shores of Tomorrow. However, this week I became increasingly disturbed as I followed the case of Tyree Nichols, the 29-year-old African-American and father of a four-year-old boy. On January 7th, precisely at 8.30, 8 p.m., 8.33 rather, Tyree was stopped by the police for an alleged traffic violation. He was beaten and died three days later in a hospital in his hometown of Memphis, Tennessee. In case you're wondering why I have on my sacerdotal garment today, my priestly robe, 
It is because I want to remind myself that I am standing in the pulpit and I must contain myself as God's representative to his people. It, this is a difficult message on which to speak. It has already helped me, that is the robe, because I was going to send to Trevor a picture, a disturbing picture of a comatose Tyree Nichols lying in a hospital bed in Memphis, Tennessee, where he took his last breath. And I was restrained. We don't need to see the image to understand the message. As a church, we must be willing from time to time to question our relevance and effectiveness in the community in which we worship. In other words, having a good program and wonderful fellowship dinners among ourselves should not constitute the apex of our existence. Are we a moral voice for change when it comes to the way the poor and less connected are treated in our society? Yes, we give out toiletries. And sometimes our pathfinders march, but is that the essence of our community involvement? And before I go any further, I would respectfully ask that no one sends me an email or call me to tell me what should be said from the pulpit. I am taking the prerogative as God's on the shepherd to speak on an issue that is relevant so the people that God loves. Personally, as a pastor, as your pastor, I must accept full responsibility for not even addressing in 2021 when the newly elected Washington County prosecutor, Eli Savitt, Savitt was leading the fight to eliminate cash bail in this county. Cash bail is a system under which the defendant who has been accused, emphasized, accused, not guilty of, accused of a crime is required to post money in order to secure his release from jail pending trial. Mr. Savitt this Wayne County prosecutor, you may recall at one time was here in an AY program, correctly recognized that cash bail is a system that disproportionately negatively impact the poor. You may remember young man Khalif Browder in New York City, 20 years of age, being arrested and charged with stealing a backpack. He had no money for cash bail and was sent to Rikers Island. And for three years, he languished in that place until eventually they caught the person who had stolen the backpack. By this time, Mr. Browder was damaged. He went home and hung himself. He had no money for cash bail. As a church, as followers of Christ, we must do more than take a back seat to the evils of our society. Something is systematically wrong with policing in our society. We can no longer afford to see these murders as individual occurrences in different cities. Michael Brown, Philando Castile, 
Eric Garner, Breonna Taylor, Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, George Floyd, and now Tyree Nichols, and countless others, all had one thing in common. And I say it without apology, the color of their skin. It would be a mistake to think that because in this case, the five officers are black that beat this guy to death, that race is not an issue. There is something called implicit bias, also referred to as unconscious bias. It affects us all including black police officers. What is implicit bias? It is our tendency to make judgments based on prejudice and assumptions rather than on indisputable facts and data. We may see a young man with sagging pants. And it's easy to conclude a lot of negative things about this young man. We may incorrectly conclude that he's up to no good and he's going nowhere. But we are shocked when we find out he graduated summa cum laude from Harvard and currently makes a six-figure salary. A common example of implicit bias is favoring or being more receptive to familiar sounding names than those from other cultural groups. Sitcoms you may remember like Martin reinforce this type of thinking. We laugh when we hear Shanene in the sitcom and we can think of a female living across the hall that doesn't mind her own business. But what does that do to us implicitly? It makes us have the same disposition to someone with a name we don't like because that name is associated with someone who's uneducated, trifling, and going nowhere. It was 32 years ago that we saw Rodney King being brutally beaten by four white police officers, and a jury found them not guilty. With the proliferation of people dying from their encounters with police, we now have body cams and diversity training. However, in a culture where violence towards black and brown people is normalized, and I'm saying that word deliberately, it is normalized, no account of diversity training will suffice. Diversifying evil does not change evil. Can somebody say amen? amen? It is still evil. Police, in their capacity, represent the state. Let me pause to let that sink in. Police, in their capacity, represent the state. And when they act, in a criminal matter, or manner rather, it is tantamount to nothing less than organized crime. They represent the state. They have the power of the state. We need to stop thinking of a few bad apples. In every state in this union, the culture of dehumanizing the poor and the less connected is alive and well. 
I have a confession to make. I often argued passionately sometimes, as my custom is, as to how we as parents should teach our black boys and girls, our brown boys and girls, how they ought to behave when stopped by the police. I, I argue with that. What they must do, yes sir, no sir. Put their hands out the window. Put your hands in the wheel. While other, of the, another uh, persuasion doesn't have to do it. We tell our boys and girls, you do that because we are interested in them coming home alive. From what I saw on the video of Tyree Nichols, there was nothing he could have done to stop what they did to him. I am now convinced that I was wrong in that emphasis. And you ask, where does the church come in? I'll tell you in a minute. I am convinced that unless we as a collective body, not just a voice here or a voice there, unless we become serious about changing the culture of policing, we will continue to have mothers and fathers crying for their children. While they dragged Tyree out of his vehicle violently, he was calm and even said, you guys are doing too much. His voice was low. What did I do wrong? They were yelling at him to get on the ground and watch this. While they were yelling at him to get on the ground, they already had him on the ground. They told him to lie face down while one was pulling his arm down and another was pulling his arm up. Even a professional contortionist could not have complied with their impossible commands. They pepper sprayed him, tased him, and for three long minutes, do you know what three minutes are like? Try it out. Go in the boxing ring and see if you can last one minute. You're panting for breath in a three minute round. And for three long minutes, they punched, kicked, and held him up while another wailed at him with a nightstick. And like George Floyd, his cries for his mother fell on deaf ears. As a church, we have to do more than offer prayers for the family. It's easy to see politicians sending out prayers while voting to keep the status quo. In our quest to follow the example of Jesus, we must work to dismantle this systemic police culture where to serve and protect is nothing more than just a slogan. All across this nation, we see behaviors from police that can more aptly be described as terrorized and dehumanized. We can't have police policing the police. Something is wrong with the system. We need more than internal affairs. We need a civilian body to be in charge of reviewing body camps. We need to get rid of qualified immunity. Now you may ask me, what is qualified immu immunity? It is a court created rule that limits victims of police violence and misconduct from holding officers accountable 
when they violate a person's constitutional rights. Getting rid of this rule will go a long way in sending the much needed message that a badge does not give the police the right to beat anyone. In my early years, I worked at a group home in Toronto, and I was trained as to how to de-escalate. There was no part of my, of my training that gave me permission to punch anyone. My training was to learn how to restrain and to take down and to put on the ground and to keep safe. And we are looking in a system that routinely allows police officers to beat people in the whole context of arresting them. The culture must change even in our courts. The culture of judges routinely giving deference to police officers must change. Judges are not stupid people, but they operate within a culture. When a judge sees a man with a swollen face, bloodied, and broken bones, and he sees the police with no marks, and then that man is charged with resisting arrest, the judge must have the sense to know this was excessive force. The culture has to change. What is the church's role in this? Well, it's not Black History Month yet, but permit me to use a quote from Dr. King. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And we have mothers and fathers in here. And you can't tell me it does not matter if your son is brutalized by the police. We need to stop apologizing by saying all police are not bad. No, there's no bad of all of anything, but there is a culture. And until we address the culture, this thing will be a part of our existence. These are not isolated incidents in isolated cities. Implicit bias is real. And the police in this particular case, after they had brutalized this guy and they recognized that they were in some trouble, they walked back to the car and one was saying, oh, he was so strong, he must have been in something. And then talked that, Tyree was trying to reach for their gun. The video does not show that because it is good that they move quickly to dismiss and to charge, but we should not be lulled into thinking that this is the norm because the culture remains the same and it will remain the same until police cannot be in charge of policing police. Dr. King said, the hottest place in hell, yes, I said it, is reserved for those who remain neutral in times of great moral conflict. As a church, we cannot take the old position. We don't want to bring persecution on ourselves. So we stay silently in a corner. We must be on the forefront of battle saying there has to be change. Qualified immunity must go. If, a, if I'm fearful that the police would kill me, I have the right to defend myself. The police doesn't have a right to kill me because he's just afraid that I put my hand in my pocket with my phone and he can kill me and nothing happens. 
there are some among us who continue to advocate that the church should not be involved. But in case you missed it, let me remind you what the text says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had set me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Ravon Wells, Tyree Nichols' mother is bruised. Tamika Palmer, Brianna, Brianna Taylor's mother is bruised. Larsena Floyd, George Floyd's mother is bruised. Valerie Castile, Philando Castile's mom is bruised. Gloria Darden, Freddie Gray's mother is bruised. Leslie Max Patton, Michael Brown's mother is bruised. Gwen Carr, Eric Garner's mother is bruised. Samaria Rice, Tamir Rice's mother is bruised. How many more mothers have to be bruising before as a body with power? Yes, the church has power. They elected somebody who was unqualified for office. Evangelicals came out in large numbers. That's power. We need to use the same power to change a system that continues to dehumanize people, particularly black and brown people. According to The Guardian, in 20... 22, what year did I say? 1,176 people died at the hands of police. Roughly 100 a day, a month rather. 100 a month at the hands of police. The church cannot sit back and accept this as normal. Our responsibility is not just for ecclesiastical things. It's not just coming and worshiping and driving home. We have a responsibility, responsibility to be in the forefront of change because the poor and the marginalized are just as much children of God as anybody else. Dr. King saying, life's most persistent and urgent question is this. What are you doing for others? Thank you.